Galatians chapter 3, beginning with verse 6. Continuing our travels through the book of Galatians, a series we've titled The Outlaw Church, a look of what life and grace is really all about. Diving right into our text this morning, verse 6, just as Abraham, Paul continuing, believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs <clears throat> on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak in the manner of men. Though it is not only a man's covenant, yet if it is confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. Now to Abraham and his seed were promises made. He does not say, into seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. And this I say that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now, a mediator does not mediate only for one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given, which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. But the scripture has confined all under sin, that the promise by faith in Christ Jesus might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith, which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. We got it? That make complete sense? Everybody tracking? We could just move right on, right? Recently, I purchased a new home in a neighborhood governed by a set of HOA covenants thinking I should, you know, familiarize myself with the rules and regulations, you know, as not to accidentally make enemies of my new neighbors, I downloaded all 30 plus pages to read. And as you can imagine, I worked my way through about three sentences of legal language and jargon before I quit. Like, forget that. If I, if I make a mistake, someone's going to let me know. I don't need to read all this. I mean, honestly, and I think you can relate to this, the way lawyers present arguments is often so confusing, so naughty, that it's almost as though they don't want you to read what they wrote, nor do they want you to understand it. I mean, seriously, all I wanted in these HOA covenants was like a Jeff Foxworthy, you might be a redneck version, <laughs> just really simple, tell me what's going on. I would have been fine with like an old school David Letterman top 10 list. Just let me know when the garbage can needs to go out, when it needs to come in, 
if I can burn leaves or not, when the pool opens. Like, I just want bullet points, a simple list. Instead, I get these covenants that I can't read and I can't understand. Have you ever kind of felt that way with Paul? I mean, this section of scripture, like you read through it and you're like, dude, I'm doing my best, man. Like, I'm tracking with you a little. And you jump around and you're moving around and like, like I kind of find that an HOA covenant is similar to the way Paul presents his arguments. Like they're really difficult to understand and sometimes a headache to follow. I mean, the way his legal mind processed things, theological, doctrinal issues, it's complicated and convoluted. And I like to think logically. Like not only is Paul's favorite literary technique the run-on sentence, and he's notorious for diving down rabbit holes, but I'm convinced that Paul, the Apostle Paul, had to be suffering from ADHD. I mean, Paul will jump from one idea to another idea, then to another idea, before coming back to his original point 20 verses later. Like, can you imagine how organized and methodical and, and easier to understand his writing style would have been if he had had access to Adderall? I mean, unbelievable. Like, he is so all over the place. I'm convinced that if we were to discover, you know, in one of these archaeological digs, an original copy of Galatians written by Paul, that it would be covered in doodling. I mean, that's just the way... His mind works, and while I appreciate it, and he makes sound arguments, it can be difficult to kind of process and work through. So, in order to unpack the essence of what we just read, so that we can all understand it, because it's not the easiest passage of Scripture to dissect, we're going to kind of take a different approach to the text than we normally do. Instead of just kind of going line by line by line, we're going to kind of approach what Paul is saying more thematically. In full disclosure, it was not a New Year's resolution for me to make my sermon shorter or to cover more scripture. Uh, it's going to take us at least two weeks to work our way thematically through this section of scripture, just kind of a full disclosure. Now, in seeking to untangle what Paul is communicating to this Galatian audience. It's helpful to understand that Paul is building here a legal argument to substantiate two points he's made in the first five verses of Galatians 3. Paul had caught word that these churches he had planted in this region known as Galatia, it's modern-day Turkey, had been entertaining false teachers who had come in peddling a gospel distortion. And as we've mentioned throughout our series, Paul had boldly declared that the gospel of Jesus Christ is grace and grace alone. That it's got nothing to do with us. It has nothing to do with our merit. It has nothing to do with us working for it or earning it, deserving it. It's a free gift given by God that we receive and we enjoy and we abide in that all we need is grace, period. That's it. That's all we need. And yet, these guys were coming in, peddling three different distortions. Yes, no one would debate that Jesus' work on the cross was important. Clearly, it's important. He wouldn't have died on the cross otherwise. So no one would debate grace as a concept. But what the legalists, these false teachers, were seeking to do, we find many doing today. It's tacking things on. Instead of grace, period, we find that this distorted gospel was grace, comma, and do these things. Is religion. Yes, you're saved by grace and the things that you do for God. Right? Or it's grace, comma, but don't do these things. Refrain from doing these things. Yes, God saves you by grace and you should be doing these things, God's cool with that, or not doing these things, God's cool with that, or the third distortion was grace, so I can do anything. Like this kind of uh, bastardized perspective of what grace is really all about, this twisting, this warping of it, and thus Paul comes in, he catches word, this is what's happening. He can't get back to Galatia. 
He's in Corinth or Athens, one of those two cities. So he pulls out parchment and he starts launching grenades, man. He's upset. He's worked up. What's being attacked is the essence of the gospel message of what Jesus came to do, of what saved him and liberated him from a life of sin and religion. And that tiresome rat race. So he's writing this letter. And in chapter three, after a history lesson he provided in chapter two, and all this stuff is online, you can get caught up if you're new with us this morning. But as he gets to chapter three, he, he, he makes two big points, kind of summarizing everything he's been saying. Two big points, and then he uses scripture, the Old Testament, to substantiate these two arguments. It's the section that we, that we just read. Now, these two points, it's important for us to keep in mind as we proceed into the text itself. In the first five verses, Paul asks this simple question. He asked the Galatians, did you receive the Spirit of God by the works of the law, your energy, your effort, something you did, or did you receive the Holy Spirit through the hearing of faith? Like Paul wants these Galatians to internalize his previous arguments concerning the essence of what justifies a person before God. What what atones for sin and makes us right in the perspectives of the Father. Had these Galatians, had anyone for that matter, you and I alike, received the Holy Spirit, were you saved through works of the law? Was there something you did that magically saved you? No, it, it wasn't, nothing at all. Had you been saved because you had done something to earn it, something to deserve it? No. Instead, this miraculous work of regeneration and salvation, whereby your sins are atoned for, and you have made, you've been made right before God, justified, so when God sees you, he sees you just as if you'd or I'd never sinned. That's the theology here. We're right from the perspectives of God. Did new birth come through the law? Or was it a miraculous thing that, that occurred through the hearing of God's word through faith? And obviously the answer and the practical experience for all of us is that you're not saved, you're not justified before God, you're not right before God because you did something. Instead, you came to church or you were talking with a friend and they were telling you about the gospel and telling you about what Jesus came and did in, you know, for you and all of these things and, and something struck a chord in your heart, you felt a move of God's spirit and you said, yes, I'm tired of trying to work for it. I'm tired of trying to earn it. I'm tired of failing over and over and over and over. I make a miserable God. I'll take that one who loves me so much that he would send his only begotten son to die for me. And in that moment, there's something that happens. Now that doesn't mean it's accompanied with like tinglys or cool water pouring down your neck, but there is a moment in time where you accept everything that Jesus did on your behalf. And there is a regeneration that begins in your soul and your heart where your desires change. Now, that doesn't mean your actions immediately change. You're still a moron. You're just a moron with Jesus, but you're still a moron. And you still make mistakes, and you still open mouth, insert foot. We're all good at those things. And yet, in this moment, this new birth, this, my desires change. My passions begin to morph. And that is a work of the Holy Spirit in your heart, and it had nothing to do with what you did, but accepting what Jesus did on your behalf. But then Paul presents this other question. He's addressing the idea of justification. How are you saved? By the law or by faith? Well, it was by faith. Okay, great. Then he says, having begun in the Spirit, it's the second question, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? It's this continuous concept. Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Like following the admission brought forth by the first question, yes, it's a work of God by faith. Paul now wants them to admit the essence of their sanctification or how are they growing? How are they developing? If you began in the spirit, is anything happening other than by the spirit? Through this saving relationship with Jesus, whereby these Galatians had been justified, that work began in the spirit, but they were now being made perfect, or literally, they were becoming more godly as a result of the Spirit and not their flesh. You know, it's only logical that the beginning 
that if the beginning of our relationship with Jesus was supernatural, then our continuance should also be the same, supernatural. Sanctification, or how I become like Christ, like justification, how my position before God is like Christ, is actually nothing more than a natural byproduct of my relationship with Jesus. That's what grace is all about. If you're found in Jesus, you're justified. Why? Because when God sees you, he sees Jesus. Thus, he sees you just as if I'd never sinned because he's seeing Jesus, who, by the way, never sinned. That's how you can be forgiven past, present, and future. That's how old things have passed away. All things have become new because God has taken care of those things because you're found in Jesus. So I'm saved because of my relationship with Jesus, but then I'm made perfect. I'm growing. I'm becoming more like Jesus. How? Well, Paul says at the end of chapter two, I died, it's no longer I who live, it's Christ who lives in me. So my job is to get out of the way. Like I'm the problem, he's the solution. If there's a problem in my marriage, it's me. I need more Jesus. I gotta die and get out of the way. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, it's Christ who lives in me and works through me. And that's the essence. Did you do something to make that happen? No, it was a work of the Holy Spirit by faith. So Paul is setting up these two arguments. It's it's the core of his entire thesis, and now he's going to begin to substantiate it. If you want to become more like Christ, you need to do nothing more than what you did for salvation. Have a relationship with Jesus, a relational association with Jesus. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he said, the only man who has the right to say that he is justified by grace alone is the man who has left all to follow Christ. And that is so true. Now, to substantiate these two points, Paul, in what we just read, lays out three arguments thematically. You're not going to find them, like, really neat and organized, but they, they jump off the page as you begin to dive through it. First, Paul will make this point, that faith in a Savior has always been central to God's plan for human righteousness. This is not anything new. Two, the law of Moses, the law, was only given to accentuate humanity's need for this Savior who had been promised, who had always been part of the plan. So his point, faith in a Savior, always part of the plan. The law given to accentuate your need for that Savior. And then thirdly, once you accept the Savior, there's now no longer a need for the law. That is what legal argument Paul is making. So we're going to unpack that over the next two weeks. First, his first point, faith in a savior has always been central to God's plan for human righteousness. While these false teachers who had come to Galatia were pointing back to Moses as the basis for their case, that obedience to the law still played a significant role. Paul does something very shrewd, very tactful. He's like, oh, you're going to call Moses to the stand. I got one better than Moses. And what does he do? He calls Abraham, the father of the nation, the father of the faith. You got Moses, I'm calling Abraham, who was like 500 years before your great Moses. And in verse six, Paul quotes directly from Genesis 15, verse six, which provides this powerful statement. Look at it again, verse six. Abraham, Paul says, believe God, And it was accounted to him for righteousness. So you're all geeked up on the law. You're so mo-driven. What I need to do, these rules, these regulations, what I eat, what I don't eat, blah, 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 blah. I call to the stand Abraham 500 years before the law because guess what? Abraham believed God. And it was accounted to him for righteousness. Like, can't you you see Paul? Like, there's in his mind, there's this court case. Like, he's the attorney tasked with defending the gospel. And he stands up and he asks the jury, according to this scripture, what was the mechanism by which Abraham became righteous before God? Was it through the law, ladies and gentlemen? It couldn't have been, right? The law wouldn't exist for another 430 years. Was Abraham made righteous through circumcision? That's also a difficult case to make because when this verse was written, circumcision wasn't a thing. It wouldn't come for 14 more years. Instead, and you can hear Paul, ladies and gentlemen, as after he's leading them through the series of thoughts, 
of the jury, I contend that this scripture clearly states that Abraham was declared righteous, not by works of obedience, the dietary law, circumcision, things that didn't exist yet, but instead by simple faith in God's promises. It's what he says, look at it. It, the fact Abraham believed God, was accounted to him or literally placed on his account by God for what? For righteousness. Now, here's a relevant question as it pertains to Paul's citing of this passage. And you can hear as he makes the argument, the prosecution standing up, objection, objection, objection. What promise had God made to Abraham that was so significant so central that it was by his belief in that very singular promise that God, quote, accounted it to him for righteousness. Because God made a lot of promises to Abraham. And it's to this point that Paul, in his legal mind, calls to the stand. Genesis 12, verse 3, 18, verse 18, 22, verse 18, 26, verse 4, 28, verse 14, which specifically records a promise that God had given on five occasions to Abraham, central to his argument. Look at verses seven and eight. Paul says, the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, in you all the nations shall be blessed. Now Paul's argument contends here that Abraham knew from the very beginning that God's purpose in calling him out of a pagan land, Ur of the Chaldeans, and leading him to a land of promise, a land that God would reveal to him, that all of this was taking place in order to then grow his descendants into a mighty nation centering on a cosmic plan that God would use to justify the Gentiles by faith. Now, keep in mind, when God originally called Abraham, there was no distinction. This is part of Paul's argument. No distinction between Jew and Gentile. Why? <laughs> there were no Jews. Like, Abraham was not a Jew. Abraham was a pagan Gentile. According to the last chapter of Joshua, he was in a pagan land worshiping foreign gods when God called him out and grew him into the Hebrew nation. But when God is... When God says that the plan is to justify the Gentiles, that's everyone. Abraham, his descendants, and everyone else alike. Abraham was a Gentile, not a Jew. And according to Paul, the gospel, or literally the good news, preached to Abraham, centered upon God's promise to bless, quote, all the nations by providing in him a way humanity could be justified. In Genesis 26, verse 4, as in chapter 22, verse 18 and 28, 14, God more specifically promised, and I'll read it for you, I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. This is the promise that God had given to Abraham. Now, knowing the obvious and in many ways understandable confusion as to what in the world God was implying, with either statement, in you or in your seed. In verse 16, Paul clarifies this point to the jury. Look at it. Paul says, now to Abraham and his seed were promises made. But note, God did not say, and to seeds, plural, as of many, but as of one, and to your seed. And then, if you notice, it's capitalized, and then Paul clarifies, who is Christ? This seed, this promised seed to Abraham is Jesus. That's the argument that Paul is making. He's saying, from the very beginning, Scripture attests that God had promised Abraham it would be through his physical lineage that a Savior would come, would be born, would descend, who would create a way by which all of humanity could be justified before God. That's the promise that God had given to Abraham. It wasn't that the Jews would bless all the nations. It was that through the Jews would come 
a savior who would bless all the nations. How? By providing a way by which Gentiles could be justified before God. So you understand how Paul is making this argument. To your seed is not many, but one, Christ Jesus. And this messianic promise of a coming seed who would save humanity was not new when God introduced it to Abraham. As a matter of fact, Genesis 3, verse 15, is when we, when we find the first manifestation of this messianic uh, promise for when God was cursing the serpent, Satan, he declared this. He said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, singular, a definitive seed. He will bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. That God's plan was to provide through the woman a seed, which is weird because women don't have the seed. Speaking of a miraculous virgin birth, the woman's seed. Now, Paul, he rests his argument here to his first point, that faith in a savior had always been central to God's plan for human righteousness. We see this as he's laying out his argument. He's saying, because Abraham believed God and that he placed his confidence in the fulfillment of God's promise of a coming Savior. It, it being what? Faith in this Savior and not obedience to the law or circumcision, that it was accounted to him for righteousness. So it was his faith in a Savior by which Abraham believed and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So what Paul is saying is he's saying the way you're saved is the exact same way Abraham was saved. Tada, the father of the faith sets the precedent. We're saved the same way, faith and a savior. Now, before we continue along Paul's line of reasoning, isn't it interesting? I don't know if this jumped out at you. It did me. How Paul viewed scripture. Not only does he call scripture to testify to the truth, that he calls scripture as the ultimate authority. He does it throughout the chapter. He's constantly quoting scripture as truth and as the ultimate authority. It's not my opinion. Let's point to scripture. Let's have a Bible study. Let's get to the bottom of it. Let's let God rule on the matter. But I love the way he presents scripture in, in this regards. He says, verse eight, look at it. The scripture foresaw, right? So the, the, the scripture had foresight. Then the scripture preached and said. Like there's no doubt here that Paul saw the scriptures as the manifestation of a person. Specifically whom? The person of God. That the scripture possessed insight, right? Right? into God's plans for humanity. Do you know the scriptures possess insight into God's plan for you and for me? That the scripture preached the gospel. That it was the scriptures that did this, that they were used to communicate God's purposes. You know, so often I hear Christians say things like this. Man, I need to, I really need to hear from God. Or they say something like, why doesn't God speak to me? Like, like you'll also hear people kind of quip, like how, how is it that I get to know Jesus? And these are all sincere questions. And yet they all reveal a tragic and in many ways misguided error in perspective. Like honestly, like what are you expecting? Like what are you expecting from God? You want God to speak to you, like, well, what does that look like? Like, what's your expectation? Will you only take God speaking to you if you go outside and there's a bush that's burning and not burning and speaking out of it? Is that the only way God speaks? Is that what you're, that, are you waiting for that? Is that what you're looking for? You're like, listen, I want God to speak to me and I will only take it in a hurricane or a whirlwind. Like, it's got to be loud trumpets, man. I need angels, a heavenly host in the sky. Like, what's your expectation for how it is God speaks? Have you ever thought about that? 
or how you get to know Jesus. Like getting real practical here. Okay, I have a relationship with Jesus, but how do I get to know him? How do I grow in that relationship? What does that look like? Well, what's your expectation for it? Can you only get to know Jesus if he shows up physically in your bedroom? Like the only way Jesus and I can talk is if he shows up on the road to Damascus or Winder. 81, you need to show up on eight, like that's, like what, what's your expectation? Because the reality is what do you think the Bible is? Like what, what is it? Is it a book of stories? Or is it the word the language, the communication of God. Because the truth is if you need to hear from God, I would ask, are you reading his word? No. That that would be like you and I having a conversation and you're like, I can't hear you because you've got earmuffs on. And I'm talking as much as I can. And then I go to write it down and you you put, you, you know, you put, like you're eliminating like the most basic forms of human communication. Like words can get twisted, right? There, there's some linguistic elements to words, language. Like words are not the best way to communicate. Like if you're married, you understand that. <laughs> Nor, by the way, are glances. Like if we're gonna go with something, look, words are better than looks. You can look at, I, I, can't, I can't read minds. Telepathy is not a thing. It it doesn't exist, ladies. Your husband needs words. And if you really, 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 really want him to know what you're saying, forget the words. Write it down. Like, if I'm going to go to the grocery store and Jessica tells me all the things she needs me to get at the grocery store, I'm going to come back with about 3% of them. And those 3% will be off. I need a list, write it down, right? Written word, it's the best form of human communication. So what are you expecting? God to use like lesser forms of human communication or the best one, written word? Where like you can dig into it, you can process it at your own speed, at your own rate. Like understand the Bible, it's not just a book of stories, it's God speaking to you, it's his word. Like in one of the most telling and radical scriptures In all of the Bible, Revelation chapter 19, verse 13, here's Jesus, the battle of Armageddon, riding a white stallion, swinging a sword, killing people, man. I mean, rocking and rolling, not even taking names. He's got the angels doing that. And in the midst of all of this, like we're given this, we're told this glorified glimpse of Jesus and he's called his name, Ah, it's the word of God. Like friend, the Bible is a living thing. Why? For in these words are found not only the communication of God, but the person of Jesus. God speaks to you and he reveals his son to you through his word. It's why that's what we do at Calvary 316. It's why when we get together, we open the Bible and we study it. I can talk politics. There's a bunch of churches that do that. I can speak to social issues. There's a lot of churches that do that. I can do a lot of different things from the pulpit as a lot of other churches do. And a lot of those things end up being more popular. I can give you 12 steps to financial freedom. Turn of the year, you're all in debt. We should do it, right? But what I've decided, the elders have decided, what God has told us is that it's more important we gather and hang out with Jesus. And how do we do that? We open his word, we get into it, and we allow him to get into us. We get to know him, his thoughts, his plans, his, his, his heart through his word. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and powerful. How? It's sharper than any two-edged sword. How? It pierces to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Why? Because you find Jesus in the midst of it. It's living because inside of it is Jesus. Like how did Abraham, Know God's plan for his life, according to Paul. The scriptures foresaw. It's exactly how it works with you and me. Psalms 119, verses 105. Your word is a great book to read to put my kid. No, your word is a lamp 
unto my feet. It's a light into my path. If you're struggling with, with where your life is going, if you're struggling with what the future looks like, what this year looks like, you're like, 2015, I ran in circles. I need to get on a track, a plan. I, I need some vision, some guidance, some purpose. How about his word? It's a light unto your path. I don't know how to get through this situation. I don't know how to get out of this problem. His word is a lamp you can use in the darkness for guidance, for direction, for insight. How did Abraham know the power of God's truth? <laughs> the scripture preached what? The gospel. I love that. The scriptures preached the gospel to Abraham. In 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 13, Paul would say, for this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectively works in you who believe. If you're messed up, and you don't have to raise your hand because they should all go up, And you're like, I, I, there are things in me that have to change. You know how they change? N not by the law. Not by you like hunkering down and doing it. Because you will always replace one vice with another. One mistake with another. You might finally be able to kick whatever habit it is. And now what? You're real filled with pride. Which now means you have more in common with Satan. Good one. You might not cuss a lot, but because you're prideful that you don't cuss a lot, you and Satan are buddies. Because his heart was welled with pride. Like it's all, the flesh is not, none are good, no, not one. So if you need help changing, transforming, developing, let the scripture preach the good news that Jesus wants to do that in you and through you that his word, that we might be men and women who plant ourselves by rivers of living water, that we would take delight in his word. How did Abraham come to know the promises of God? <laughs> the scriptures said, the scriptures told him. Hebrews 11 verse three, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. You might be like, I need a Hail Mary. I need a change in me that I'm not even possible. Like it's, I need something created that doesn't exist. God's in the business of doing that. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth out of nothing. He said, when there was only darkness, let there be light. And there was light. It might not be in you yet. That's okay. God's good at making things that aren't there out of nothing. And how does he do it? He does it through his word. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Faith comes how? By hearing and hearing how? By the word of God. This morning, know Jesus, know grace, know his word. Now, in order to unpack the significance of what Paul, of Paul using Abraham as this example of justification by faith, you should understand, and we should take a moment to unpack this phrase, Abraham believed God, right? Because what, what Paul is communicating by saying Abraham believed God is not the same thing as belief in God. And we should qualify the two. Believe in God is not the same as belief in God. Nowhere in Scripture do we find this presentation that an intellectual belief in God is the basis of righteousness. Instead, it's believing God in the fact that you're placing one's complete faith and trust in Jesus that is the basis of righteousness. Like, I hope you realize, and this might be a controversial statement, but whatever, here goes. You realize believing in God doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I believe in God. I'm going to heaven. No, you're not. You're going to hell. Like, you're just going to be, be ready for the one who's going to send you because you believe in him. That's good. 
like tragically, and this seems to be this predominant perspective of those born and raised in the Bible Belt, that we had this false sense of our eternal security because we don't understand that an intellectual belief that God exists or that the person of Jesus exists or that his death on the cross paid for my sins or even that, his, that he was resurrected on the third day, believing in those things doesn't mean you're saved. Over and over, you Christian, oh, I'm Christian. Oh, I'm a Christian. I went to my, my daddy's church, my great-granddaddy's church. I'm sure it was his great-great-granddaddy's church. They're all buried out front. Well, what makes you a Christian? I'll believe, I'll believe in God. Oh, I believe in God. I believe that that's his word, that Jesus, born as a little baby, swaddling clothes in the manger, grew up, died on the cross for me. Yeah. I believe he was a historic person, that he did what he did, and he rose on the third day. I believe all that. Okay. Like you realize, an intellectual belief in those things does not make you right before God. That's not what's being communicated that Abraham believed God. Like to this point, James, you know, it had to have been difficult being the half brother of Jesus. You know, same mom, different dads. You can put it together. James, big brother, Jesus. I mean, how do, will you ever clean up your room to compare to Jesus? You know, he can walk in and be like, and the toys part. You know, I mean, like, like you're James, you're at a marked disadvantage. And he says to this point, he says in chapter 2, verse 19 of his letter, sarcastically rather, you believe that there's one God? You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. You know, you know, you know Satan is a theist. Like all of those things he intellectually believes. He was there. He saw it. He witnessed it. It doesn't make you saved. It doesn't make you right. The idea presented by Paul is that Abraham was declared to be right before God because he placed his complete weight upon God. That's what this word believe means. To place your complete weight. He trusted God. He was confident in God. Abraham, God gave him a deck, gave him a hand of cards. He looked at it. He pushed all the chips to the center. He went all in. I'm going to let it ride on that. I got no contingency plan. Like that's what's being communicated. It's faith, it's trust, it's confidence. It's going all in, pushing the chips into the center of the table and saying, you gave me these cards, I'm playing them. That's all I got. He placed his faith in God. Think about it this way. You know you've placed your faith in something, whether it's a person, a system, a thing. For if that thing happens to fail, everything else in your life falls apart. Like that's how you know if you really believe or have faith in something. This stool if I place my faith in this stool by sitting on this stool and this stool lets me down, what naturally happens? Boom, I'm down for the count. Gravity takes over. I fall apart. Whatever you place your faith in, if it lets you down, everything gets tumbled. Like that's what's being communicated by faith in God. Abraham believed. He put it all in. If God failed, Abraham was screwed. That's what's being communicated. Like, for example, it becomes very evident, quickly evident. The gal who ends up melting into a complete puddle of my life is totally over because her pimple-faced boyfriend broke up with her. Like, it's clear in that dynamic that she didn't have a boyfriend. She had an idol she was placing her faith into because he broke up with her, and what happened? My life falls apart. Well, that's faith. That's faith. Or it's the guy who like immediately descends into a spiral of my life no longer has any meaning because he got fired from his job at Taco Bell. Like he's not working a job. Instead, he's erected an idol 
he's worshipped and placed his faith in. The easiest way to know if you really have faith in Jesus, if you've placed your complete weight on him, is to consider this question this morning. If Jesus failed, would your life fall apart? I mean, every part of it would come untethered. I mean, if a relationship with Jesus didn't justify, would I be entering eternity in deep trouble? Now, the good thing is that that's only a theoretical question and not one based in reality, for Jesus will never fail you. And that's proved in the fact that he did what no one else could do. He rose from the dead. His resurrection shows he's trustworthy, that he knows what he's talking about. And yet, the sad truth is that many of those who believe in Jesus are not in actuality placing their complete trust in Jesus. For if Jesus indeed failed, nothing in their life would suffer as a result. Like, what about you? What would happen in your life? What would be totally destroyed? You see, walking by faith creates this dynamic. Because faith in God's promises is akin to going for broke, it declares, I'm in big trouble if Jesus doesn't come through. That's what faith is all about. Let me speak personally just for a moment. Ever since we launched Calvary 316, Jess and I have felt the desire, the longing to move from Snellville closer to the church. And while a slowly recovering housing market made things very difficult this summer, God was kind of clear. He said, move. Now, I could come up with 100 reasons why this wasn't a wise decision. We didn't need to move. We liked our home. We were financially stable. We had just had Theodore in February and like the thought of moving with an infant and a three-year-old just sounded terrible. I work a second job in Snellville to supplement my income, so I was close to it, et cetera, et cetera. I come up with all the reasons. And yet, God said, put the house on the market. Trust me. And so we did. And to our surprise, our house sold for enough where we didn't lose our shirt didn't make anything, but didn't lose our shirt. And on the flip side, we were able to buy a house into a neighborhood we never thought we'd be able to buy into for like $40,000 under the appraised value. Like God really showed up and did a cool thing. Very cool. All right, cool. God. Everything. Everything seemed to be falling into place. Like the dominoes fell one by one. There was just one issue. The two months in which all of this was happening, September and October of this past year, the offerings at Calvary 316 tanked. I mean, tanked to the lowest levels in years. Like seriously, every Monday morning, when I go into the office to log the offering, to look at the bank balance, I sunk into a depression. Thinking to myself, what am I doing selling my house and buying another one? When I'm gonna have to find a third job just to, to make ends meet. Anyway, and I can be melodramatic. <laughs> One of these, as they came to be known, Blue Mondays. One of our elders, Joe, who's in there with our kids, he invited me over to eat some of our world famous, some of his world famous wings, watch a terrible Monday night football game because they've all been terrible. Just bad scheduling, I don't know. Anyway, we're sitting on the back deck, eating some wings, hanging out. Joe, as one of the elders, reviews the finances month by month, as all all of our elders do. And he turns to me and he says, he says, you know, I didn't bring it up. He brought it up. You know why the finances have gotten tight over the last month? I immediately started thinking to myself, come on, man. Like it's Blue Monday. Like, I'm already at, like, the verge of suicide. Like, are we, like, like, really, man, is this what's going down? Like, this is not the time. This is not the time for you to tell me that the Bible studies have been subpar or, like, the bass guitar is too loud. Like, I have a wife who's good at that. 
I don't need you to do that. No, instead, Joe just looked at me. He said, yeah, I'm pretty sure giving is down because God told you to move. And now he wants to stretch your faith. You know, remain obedient when it's tough. You know, to be in a position where if he doesn't come through, everything falls apart. Now, some of you are sitting there thinking, I knew not tithing was, was God leading me. No, 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 no. <laughs> this is secondary. But, I, but I'll be honest. Like, I drove home that night from Joe's, so encouraged. I really did. Uplifted. And I remember praying. I said, okay, God, this is all on you. Where you guide, you provide. I'm going for it because you told me to. Your reputation's on the line, not mine. Well, we moved into the house the last weekend of October, and guess what? November ended up being the largest tithing month we've had in years, <laughs> right after I had moved. Now, it's weird, the new year. Like, with the new year, just one day change. We get nostalgic you know, a new year, a fresh start. We, we start thinking that way. Like we begin to think about resolving to do something next year that we didn't do the previous year. Now, I'm not, I'm not really interested in like the weight loss you're determined to shed in 2016. You won't. You'll get fatter. <laughs> it's been my experience like four years running. That elliptical, not even in my house. I've left it in storage. Anyway, <laughs> I was like, man, that was a workout, moving it. I'm leaving it in Larry's garage. Larry, you should use the elliptical. <laughs> Most New Year's resolutions that you make January 1, statistically, like 80%, 90% of them are done and over with by February 1st. Really, 30 days is all you need to prove you're a failure. <laughs> I'm not interested in that, but I am interested in just kind of wrapping things up this morning by speaking concerning faith. Like that, that you might this year make a resolution to walk by faith. By faith. Like first, everything we've been talking about over the last few months concerning the gospel of grace, period. Do you realize it doesn't matter if your relationship with Jesus is only in the fact that you know his name and you affirm he exists, but you don't know him? Like grace, period, grace alone only works if you go all in. Grace is amazing for it justifies you before God. It frees you to live a life of godliness by allowing Jesus to live in you and through you. And yet none of that happens if you're not willing to go all in to place your faith in Jesus. If you haven't done that, I encourage you to start the year off by doing so. But for those of us who are walking with Jesus, may I, may I ask, what has Jesus been trying to accomplish in your life that has been hindered by the will of your flesh? Like, has Jesus been trying to break you of material dependence, security, by making you more generous? Not because you have to, you don't have to, but Jesus was generous. So if I'm becoming like Christ by letting Jesus live in me and through me, then I should be more generous. That should be a natural thing. I don't have to, but if Jesus is generous, he's in me living through me, then I should be more generous. But I'm, my flesh has been restricting that because of the security issues. And like, I just don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. Like, is, is God wanting you to become more generous? Not to be or do generosity, but to be generous. But your flesh, your unwillingness to let go and go all in has been hindering you? Like, has Jesus been trying to transform specific areas of your life that aren't spiritually healthy, profitable, but your flesh has been limiting that work because you're afraid of losing a group of friends or, or being lonely? Has Jesus been trying to lead you into a new opportunity, but your flesh has been limiting this work because it prefers comfort versus the, the, the unknown of uncertainty? Has Jesus been trying to free you of a hurt or a pain, but your flesh has been limiting this work out of fear that Jesus might not be good enough to follow through on his promises? This morning I ask, 
Do you have faith in God? As Abraham believed and it was accounted for him for righteousness, are you willing to do the same? Or better yet, what has Jesus done to warrant not being fully trusted? Why not go all in? Is he not trustworthy? Has he not done enough? May this year, may this year be marked in your life as a time that you place your faith in Jesus, that you believe he'll make good on his promises. May this year be a year, this morning, that you go all in, that you fully believe. And so, Father, Father,